from Revelation 3, 7 through 13 today. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, the words of the Holy One, the true one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, who say that they are Jews and are not but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world, to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have, so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. And I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. Would you pray with me? King Jesus, you are the Holy One, you are the True One, and you are the head of your church, so we ask for you to lead us. God, as I preach today, the goal is not for this gathering of people to sit under my authority, but for all of us, myself included, to submit ourselves to your authority as you speak to us through your word. So, Lord, guard my mouth. Use it for the good of your people. Give us ears to hear what your spirit says to the church. We want to hear... Like the psalmist says, you want to hear joy and gladness. Lord, even if your word should cut us deeply today, help us to see the cuts of your word like the work of a surgeon who cuts in order to heal and breaks in order to mend. Help us to rejoice at your word, Lord God. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. How about people said? Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. Uh, earlier this week, it was like 95 degrees on Tuesday. And some of us uh, from the church meet over at Genoa Park and play basketball on Tuesday nights. If you want to come and join us, it'd be awesome. And so uh, we were debating all day, like, do we really want to play in the heat? And, uh, and we ended up, you know, screwing up our courage and we went and, and we sweat so much and I learned like that's, oh, this is what sweat's for. Like the heat isn't so bad. And I didn't know that we'd have to implement that principle in church on a Sunday. And I'm <laughs> sorry for that. I am warm this morning. I'm praying for your endurance. Please pray for mine. Um, my name's Ethan. I'm one of the pastors here at Union. And it's my privilege to open up the word this morning. I've had a couple weeks off. Uh, my family was on vacation and then just got a week to, to serve in the background here. And Pastor Kyle served us, serves us continually so well as a church. I'm so grateful that I get to lead and shepherd alongside of him. Um, we've been working our way through this series in the first few chapters of Revelation. And if you haven't already opened up your Bible to Revelation chapter 3, I'd love for you to get your eyes on that text we have. Bibles at every communion station. We have them over at the Connect station. If you don't have one uh, on your device or in your lap, we'd love for you to grab one of those and, and open it up because um, we'll be working through the text and it'll be good for you to look at it as we work through it. So like I said, we've been working through this series in the first three chapters of Revelation. Revelation, as we've been saying, is a letter written to Christians to build up the church in courage and endurance as we follow Jesus in the world. And so I, as I was prepping this week, I, I had the thought that the book of Revelation is kind of like the screening of the film. Like imagine all of us are gathered in, in a movie theater, we're about to see the premiere of a new movie. And before the room goes dim, and, 
and the screen kind of flickers on for us to see the movie, the director comes out front. And he introduces the film that he's about to show. And he says to the audience, this movie that I'm about, I'm about to show you, I made it for you. And so as you watch it, pay attention to these things and, and watch for this to happen. And, and when this comes in the movie, I want it to hit you this way. And I want you to leave the movie feeling this kind of way. And, and all this movie that we're about to watch that, that stokes our imagination with its drama and its color and its brilliance, all of a sudden, the director gives it a direction, a purpose, a meaning. And that's kind of what Jesus is doing as he writes letters to the churches in the first couple chapters of the book of Revelation. The whole book of Revelation is a collection of images and colors and brilliance and drama, and it's, it's for God's people. And in the letters that Jesus is writing to the seven churches here in Revelation 2 and 3 that we've been working through over the last few weeks, it's like Jesus the director is coming out and saying, this display of images and scenes and brilliance that you're about to see, this is how I want you to apply this. This is how I want you to understand this. This is why it's relevant for you right now. This is what I see in your life that you're going to see show up in the, the film that you're about to see as you see it play out through John's pen over the pages of scriptures. So these visions are, are for your courage. They're for your faithfulness. And as they play across the pages of scripture, here's how you're meant to take them to heart. That's what Jesus is saying to us. That's what he says to the churches, the, the real churches, the seven churches in Asia Minor that he originally wrote to. We, we've looked at five of those letters so far. We've looked at Ephesus, the church in Smyrna, the church in Pergamum, the church in Thyatira, the church in Sardis. And today we're in the sixth letter, the letter to the church in Philadelphia. And so before we dive into the text, I wonder if you have ever had the experience of trusting something only to have it fail you. Like uh, when I was a kid, I did a little bit of tree climbing. And from what I remember, inevitably, whatever tree I climbed, I would get to this point and I would I'd have firm footing and then I was gonna put my foot on another branch. And I didn't know if the next branch would hold me. And so you would kind of play this game of like gingerly testing the branch and like slowly putting your weight on it and then slowly like releasing the branch that you've been holding on to with your hands. Uh, I wasn't much of a risk taker kind of kid, so I don't have any stories of the branches breaking because I just went down the tree before I got high enough. But could you imagine that feeling if you did put all your weight on the branch and it all of a sudden phew, fell out from beneath you? I think many of us, maybe not, maybe all of us, could imagine that feeling because in, in one way or another we've experienced it. Maybe you didn't fall out of a climbing tree, but you did put all of your trust in something. You put all of your trust in a person, only to have the person fall out from beneath you. Lean with all your weight into a career, and the career snapped under your feet. You rested your hopes on a vision for the good life that in the end left you empty, even as you achieved it. You bought that product, or you signed up for that plan, only to have it not deliver on its promise to you. So to one degree or another, I bet we could all name ways that we've put our trust in someone or something only to have it fail us. So it's no wonder that the world is full of jaded and anxious and weary and bitter people because our trust has been broken and it's been broken by friends and lovers and pastors and politicians and institutions. So who can we trust? Well, like Pastor Kyle said, to all who are weary and need rest, and to all who are jaded and anxious and need someone they can trust, come to Jesus because 
He's the rest for the weary, and he's the one who is trustworthy. This is how Jesus presents himself in the letter to the church in Philadelphia. And this is how this text is calling us to see him as the trustworthy one who will hold our full weight, who will never fail us as we lean into him. And the security that we have in Jesus releases us to be a people who endure. A people who endure despite evil that may come against us. And so as we unpack the letter to the church in Philadelphia, we're going to see that since Jesus is the one true Messiah, we can trust him. We can trust him to work through us. We can trust him to vindicate us. We can trust him to preserve us. We can trust him to reward us. So let's look at the passage. Let's start together at verse 7. Chapter 3, verse 7. It says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one will open. In all seven letters to the churches, uh, Jesus gives an introduction to, him, to himself that reveals part of his character. And in this letter to the church in Philadelphia, this is the longest introduction that Jesus gives of himself. And here in the letter to the church in Philadelphia, his introduction is particularly significant, I think, for how we're to interpret the rest of Jesus' letter to the church. So let's spend some time just in this first verse and look at how Jesus introduces himself. First, he calls himself the Holy One. So remember, Jesus is like the director who's introducing the film of the book of Revelation, right? He comes out before the film screening, he gets you to pay attention to certain parts of that film that are about to be shown. And, and so here, in this letter, the director is, is giving himself a title and, and kind of connecting it to things that are to come in the book of Revelation. He gives himself this title that, that hyperlinks back to parts of the Old Testament but it's also hyperlinking forward to the book of Revelation. Holy one. God, only God is holy. Jesus connects himself to the person and work of God. He says in the very next chapter in the book of Revelation, chapter 4, John's going to be shown this vision of the throne room of God. And it's, it's a vision where angels never cease to say as they fly around the throne of God, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Then in chapter 6, it says that those who've been slain because of the word of God, they cry out to the throne of God. And they say with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true. In chapter 15, all God's people sing a song to him. And one of the lyrics of the song is, You alone are holy. Then in chapter 16, John hears an angel say to God, Just are you. O Holy One. No one but God could, with integrity, take on the title, the Holy One. That's a name that is worthy of God and God alone. He alone is holy. So what Jesus is doing as he addresses the church in Philadelphia is implicitly reminding his people of what he said explicitly in the Gospels when he was here on earth. He said in the book of John, I and the Father are one. He's saying to the churches, I am not just a man. I'm not an angel or, or a spiritual teacher. I am God. That is who I am. And in a similar way, he says, I'm the Holy One and I'm the True One. And again, he's linking himself to visions that are to come in the book of Revelation. I already quoted one to you in Revelation chapter 6. It says, those who've been slain for the word of God, they cried out to God and they called him, O sovereign Lord, holy and true. And then at the end of the book of Revelation, in chapter 19, John sees heaven opened and behold, a white horse. And the one who rides the horse is called faithful and true. So the, the original Greek that John wrote in in book of Revelation. In chapter 3, the word for true, it means authentic. 
So this Jesus is not just similar to God. This Jesus is not a false Messiah. He's the real deal. And that's significant when we consider the opposition to the gospel that's kind of taken root in the church uh, in the city of Philadelphia. We'll, we'll touch that more later. Jesus is saying to the church in Philadelphia, I'm the Holy One. I'm the true one. And since he's holy, that means he's good. He's without sin. He's perfect. He's perfect in all of his ways. He's a good God. And since he is true, since he is authentic, that means he's trustworthy. He's good. He's trustworthy. And he holds the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. That's all one title. It's, it needs hyphens all the way through. The, key, the one who holds the key of David, who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one's open. One title. And, and that title that Jesus uses to identify himself, it, it, it's going to take a little unpacking, but it's really fascinating to me. Stay with me. Because I think if we do a little bit of work together, we'll be able to see an even clearer picture of how Jesus wants the church to hear his letter. So, so this title, the, the one who has the key of David who opens and no one will shut and shuts and no one opens, is a title that was used in the Old Testament. And it was given to a man who played a role in the history of the nation of Israel. Actually, by then it was called the nation of Judah. It had split into two countries and so there was one king over the, the nation of Judah. And the man who, in the history of, of God's people, was given this title we now understand to be a type. Now a type is someone who lived before Christ came and whose life in some way paints a picture that helps us understand the ultimate thing, the ultimate purpose that the Messiah comes for. And there's lots of types throughout the Old Testament. Many people can be seen now as, as types of the Messiah who is to come. And in Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, in chapter 22, the prophet Isaiah is speaking to the city of Jerusalem, the capital of Judah, and he's speaking as God's mouthpiece. And so one of the things that God says through Isaiah to the city of Jerusalem is that the king, Hezekiah, has a steward over the city, and the steward's name is Shebna. So if anybody, you know, we got lots of babies being born at church. And if you need a good name for your baby, Shebna is a good one. I'm putting that in mind. But God, God is going to remove Shebna. So maybe don't use that. He's going to remove Shebna from his office. And instead, he's going to call his servant Eliakim to be the steward over the city of Jerusalem. And God says in Isaiah 22, 22, and I will place on his shoulder, on Eliakim's shoulder, the key of the house of David. He shall open and none shall shut. He shall shut and none shall open. And that's the title that Jesus attributes to himself here in Revelation. And then back in Isaiah, it goes on to say that basically God will keep his people safe and secure under Eliakim's stewardship, under his care. And that Eliakim will be like a good father to the city of Jerusalem. And that the honor of God's people will rest on Eliakim's shoulders. Now, this is, we're getting kind of deep into the weeds of Jewish history, but stay with me. Because here's where it gets interesting. In Eliakim's day, there was one terrifying threat to God's people. And it was the nation of Assyria. And they were this barbaric idol-worshipping, cruel beyond cruel. They make the Nazis look like they're just children in their cruelty. And they threaten to invade the city of Jerusalem. And on one occasion, the Assyrians surrounded the city of Jerusalem and they put it under siege. And King Hezekiah sends out Eliakim along with some others to kind of parley with the Assyrians. And when they go out, they stand in front of the city gates, they meet the representatives from the Assyrians, and the Assyrians spend their whole meeting in front of the city gates where the whole city can hear loudly insulting Eliakim and King Hezekiah and God. And they say to the city, don't let your king fool you into trusting the Lord. 
don't say the Lord will deliver us. Because we're going to conquer you. And we're going to make a fool of your king. And we're going to make a fool of your God. They ridicule God's people for trusting in the Lord. And so in a time when the enemies of God viciously ridicule his people for trusting the Lord, in a time when it seemed like Jerusalem and the city of God would be overrun, God says, under Eliakim's care, this city will be locked. And nobody's going to open it unless Eliakim opens it. And so now, jump back to Revelation with me. Revelation 3, the letter to the Philadelphian church. We don't know much about this church. There's no record in the New Testament of the planting of the church in Philadelphia. But Jesus says in verse 8 that they are a little church. They have but little power. So we, we don't know how this church was planted, but if it follows the pattern of the rest of the New Testament and Paul's missionary journeys, it's likely that when the gospel came to the city of Philadelphia, whoever brought it, whatever apostle or missionary came to that city, went first to the Jewish synagogue. Because the coming of Jesus is the fulfillment of, of everything the Jews had waited for. They are supposed to be the people who are on watch for the Messiah. And so they would preach the gospel in the synagogue first. But it's likely that when the gospel was preached in the synagogue, it was rejected. In fact, Jesus calls those who are oppressing the church in Philadelphia a synagogue of Satan, which seems to imply that the Christians have been thrown out of the synagogue. Some accepted the gospel, came to believe in Christ as the, as the Messiah, but, but then they were thrown out of the synagogue, which was a big deal in the Roman Empire because in the Roman Empire, the Jews were the only people who had the right to worship just one God. And everybody else in the Roman Empire had to worship uh, the God of the empire. They had to partake in the temple rituals if they wanted to enter into the economy of the city. It was a big deal to be thrown out of the synagogue because then it was the Jews rejecting you. You no longer had the protection that the Jewish synagogue had, which meant you were laid bare to persecution. You were laid bare to economic hardship. You were rejected by culture. And so the church in Philadelphia was worshiping Jesus as the Messiah they were saying, this is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. And the Jews who were supposed to be ready and waiting for the Messiah, they were ridiculing them. They were rejecting them. They were saying, this Jesus of Nazareth, he was not the real Messiah. And this is why it's so striking when Jesus calls himself the true one. He says, I am the authentic Messiah. You've rejected me, but I'm the one that you've been waiting for. And so as they endure persecution, under this pressure to stop trusting Jesus as the Savior, the Philadelphian church receives this letter from Jesus that says, those people who are pressuring you to mistrust me, they call themselves Jews. And they think they are God's people. But they're just like those Assyrians who came up to the city gates. They are enemies of God. They're not doing the work of God. In denying Jesus, they are doing the work of Satan. But you, Philadelphian church, this is what Jesus says to them. You are the true Jews. You are the true people of God. And I, Jesus, I am the substance that Eliakim foreshadowed. I am the authentic one under my care you will be held secure. I hold the keys to the city. And though you feel like you may be overwhelmed, if I say the gates are shut, they will never be open. And if I open the gates, they will never be shut. And this is the beginning of Jesus' word of encouragement to this faithful church. All well, in five of the seven letters, Jesus has a word of correction for the churches. But for two, 
for the church in Smyrna, and for this little embattled church in Philadelphia. Jesus has no word of correction, which doesn't mean they are perfect. But it means that they have been faithful in a way that Jesus only wants to encourage. He offers them hope in his name. And friends, if Jesus is who he says he is, then, then the security and the hope and the encouragement that he extends to the Philadelphian church is a hope that he extends to you if you will follow him and trust him. Day. So if you're not sure whether you can put your full weight onto Jesus Christ because of all your experience in the world, which has showed you that, that the world does nothing but wound you and, and, and hurt you and, and break your trust, then this letter from Jesus assures you, you can let down your guard with him. You can relax into Jesus. You can pour out your anxieties to him. You can show all your failures and imperfections to Him. You can draw security from Him. In other words, you can trust Him because He's the true and authentic Messiah. And if you believe that Jesus is the one true Messiah, your King, your Savior, that means that you can trust Him. And you can trust Him to, to work through you. You can trust Him to vindicate you and to preserve you and to reward you for your faithfulness to Him. That's what the rest of this letter is all about. We can trust Jesus to work through us. Listen, the world shapes us as we live in it. We are constantly being discipled by the world around us. And the world we live in shapes us to believe that the only things that really matter are the things that are large and famous and fast. So if you don't ever do anything particularly large or famous or fast, then you might be tempted to believe that you don't matter or that the things you invest yourself in are not worth it. But Jesus says to the church in Philadelphia, I know you have but little power, and yet you've kept my word and not denied my name. So this, this small church has kept Jesus' word. Later in verse 13, he says they're a church that's had to endure patiently. So there's nothing fast or famous or large about these people, this church, this gathering of God's people. And yet, to this unknown, small, slow church, Jesus says, I know your works. And behold, I've set before you an open door which no one is able to show. So Jesus knows the works of his church, and the works of this church are that they've kept his word, they've not denied his name. Friends, the word of God is alive. It's, the scriptures say they are living and active. It is powerful. The word of God is life-giving. And when the word of God is treasured in the hearts of God's people, it, by its very nature, it creates opportunities for ministry. You know, in the book of Acts, which is this record of the, the growth and expansion of the, the brand new church throughout the Roman Empire, you know, every time it talks about the church growing, there's a line that gets, gets used. It says, not that the apostles preached great sermons, not that many people heard the gospel and believed, you know what it says? The word of God increased. And many were added to their number. And, and so throughout the New Testament, we see this at play. And one of the phrases that gets used as kind of a shorthand for opportunities for the Word of God to increase is, is the phrase, an open door. It's, it's shorthand for the gospel to be preached. And so when you keep the Word of God, Jesus opens doors. And when Jesus opens doors, no one can shut them but Him. And that is good encouragement for people like us who are a part of a little church plant that not many people have heard of. I can tell you, the mission of our church has never been to be large or famous or to do things quickly. But sometimes, 
it can feel like how how will our little church with limited volunteers and small children's ministry and small staff like no building how will we ever get a chance to make disciples in our community like we really want to will we ever get to baptize newly converted Christians will we ever be able to plant other churches will we ever feel like we have space for ministry that belongs to us and sometimes when I go down all of those questions down the rabbit hole being large and famous and fast sounds really nice sounds really appealing but Jesus' word for our little church and his word for you is to keep his word and let him be in charge of opening the door. So we can trust that Jesus will work through us. We can also trust that Jesus will vindicate us. Look at verse 9. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Friends, to follow Jesus, it means to embrace a life as exiles from culture. To embrace a life in the unpopular minority. And this has been the dominant theme in the church for the last 2,000 years. Even in times like like maybe would have, we would have experienced it in recent history or, or times throughout the last 2,000 years when there have been pockets, short pockets of time where the church has had kind of cultural dominance. That's actually proved to be bad and corrupting for God's people. To follow Jesus means that we embrace a life as exiles. And so that means that we will have to endure the scoffing of the world. And it means we may have to endure much worse than just scoffing. To be a Christian means to be like Eliakim, standing before the gates of Jerusalem, hearing the, uh, the insults of your enemies against you and your God and your leaders, pummeling you, scoffing at you for trusting in the Lord. And maybe you've already tasted some of that because you've held on to the name of Christ. Maybe you've endured ridicule, but Jesus promises us that though we endure for the name of Christ, we will see a day when those who have cast us out will bow at our feet and repent. And they will know that Jesus is real and that he has loved his people. The psalmist prays in Psalm 43, Vindicate me, O God. And defend my cause against an ungodly people from the deceitful and unjust man. Deliver me. And Jesus says to his people, justice belongs to me. I will vindicate you. Not only will we be vindicated if we trust in Jesus, but we will be preserved. We can trust Jesus to preserve us as we endure. Look at verse 10. Because you've kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that's coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. So just as keeping the word of Jesus gives birth to opportunities for ministry, keeping the word of Jesus also produces in us, forges in us an ability to endure through suffering. So don't ever let anybody convince you that Christianity promises a way out of suffering. That's not the promise of Christ. He doesn't promise us to take out, he doesn't promise to take us out of trial. He promises to give us spiritual protection through suffering, to preserve us through suffering. The rest of the book of Revelation will go on to paint a picture of judgment and tribulation. And despite what some popular theologies about the end times would like us to, to believe, I believe strongly that the book of Revelation tells us that we are not going to be raptured out of the suffering that's to come. 
that we are in the last days and we are enduring the tribulation that, that, that Christ has promised will come. And the picture that the book of Revelation paints is one of a people who come out of the tribulation washed white by the blood of Christ, preserved by the one who has saved them. The people of God will endure trials, but they will be kept tender toward the Lord. They, they will be kept ready for glory with Him. But those lost people who, who endure trial without the Lord, their hearts will be hardened. The trial will embitter them towards God. They will be hardened toward Him. Eventually they will be running headlong away from Him and toward wrath. And if we will trust Jesus as our true Savior, we can trust Him to preserve us through trial. Finally, we can trust Jesus to reward us. Verse 12, look at that with me. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. So think about this. Think about what we've already learned together. The church that's been cast out of the synagogue, ridiculed by the synagogue of Satan, as, as not really a part of the Jewish people, not really worshiping the Messiah that the people of God waited for. Jesus, is prom Jesus promises this reward, that those who cast them out of the synagogue, those who've been cast out of the synagogue will become instead immovable pillars in the temple of God. And those who've been seen by the synagogue of Satan as not belonging to God's people, they will be marked. They will be marked as belonging to the city of God, as belonging to the new Jerusalem, as belonging to Jesus, the Holy One and the True One. And so all these promises are around the temple, and, and yet at the end of Revelation, in the new heavens and the new earth, when, when John sees the new Jerusalem, he says of the new city that he sees, I saw no temple in the city. For its temple is the Lord, the God Almighty in the land. And so that means that these promises that Jesus is giving the Philadelphian church are meant to tell us that, that the real promise of Jesus to his faithful church is not to make them a fixture in a physical temple, but it's to bless them with his presence which they will never leave. This is the promise of the gospel. This is the hope that Jesus offers you when you keep his word. Listen to Revelation chapter 21. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with humanity. He will dwell with them. They will be his people. He will be their God. And God himself will be with them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no, no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. Jesus is the one true Messiah. And we can trust him to work through us. And to vindicate us. To preserve us. And to reward us with his presence. To the church in Philadelphia, this little church of little power, Jesus wrote this letter. And you know the history of the church in Philadelphia? This little church lasted for 1,200 years. It lasted until all the members of the church were martyred by the armies of Muhammad. It has a history longer than most countries and empires. It was faithful to the end. And it was faithful because it was built on the foundation of Jesus Christ and his trustworthy promises. So my question for you is, who or what are you trusting? Or do you find it difficult to trust anyone at all? 
trust Jesus. To trust Jesus, I think practically, it means to pray to Him, to study His Word as if it is God's voice given to you, because it is. And to study it as if to know the Word means to know the character of God, because it does. To keep and obey the Word out of a love for Christ, Knowing that He has loved you and that your obedience doesn't earn His love, but is, a, is an overflow of your love and commitment to Him. And to those who keep His Word, He will work through and vindicate, preserve, and reward. This is what it means to trust Jesus. So will you set aside your trust in the things of this world? And will you trust Him? That's a word that Jesus gave to the church in Philadelphia. He who has an ear to hear, let me hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, holy one, faithful and true, we need need your help. We need your spirit to help us to take the seed of your word and plant it down deep in our hearts and cause it to bear fruit. God, only you can do that work. So we trust you. We lean into you. Help to remove all barriers so that we might put our full weight on you. I just pray in Jesus' name against any sort of lie from the enemy that would keep us from trusting you. We pray against the, the works of the enemy that wants to come against your church, God. We claim and remember that you are the one who opens and no one will shut. Who shuts and no one will open. We trust that you will keep your people God, let the, the enemy have no foothold in our church and in these people. Let there be no roadblocks to us trusting in your promises. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Just stand and sing together.